I think I will switch back to the uh, hand mic. Uh, you have to have a professor at an alumni event. Well, I'm your professor. <laughs> Uh, I am trained as a psychologist. I've been uh, doing research on decision making for the last 30 years, uh, teaching and working both in psychology departments and business schools. And here at Columbia, I'm cross-appointed in both. Uh, what I want to do is sort of give you a couple of lessons. I don't have nine, I only have two, <laughs> uh, that I've abstracted from my own research and those of colleagues. Uh, and then also from a much more abstract perspective than this wonderful uh, case studies we've heard, unpack them a little bit and sort of explore why we do what we do and what we should perhaps be doing instead a little bit differently, okay? So let me start with lesson number one. Lesson number one is we should start thinking about career opportunities or life changes a lot earlier than when we usually do it. Usually we do it when things are starting to go badly and we've been pushed into thinking about change. What we should be doing instead is to start thinking about it when things are going well, yeah? Now why? Why, why should we do that and why don't we do that, including myself, most of the time? Well, reason number one why we don't do what I just told you is that we all are stick in the muds. We all start as quo biased, yeah? And that's not necessarily a bad thing. When things are going well, uh, yeah, there's sort of no reason to think about why things could be doing, going better than they are. Uh, we tend to be risk averse. We think about what's good about our current state of affairs and there are many reasons for that. Uh, there are many, many other things we could be doing, but there's so many of them. It's hard to generate what they should be doing, what, what, what they should be, and it's hard to evaluate them because there's so many of them. The other reason, reason number two why we don't do what we should be doing is we are overconfident. Yeah? And I think all of the previous speakers gave us lots of uh, examples for why we should be worrying about things going south. Yeah? We shouldn't be just assuming things are fine the way they are and will continue like that, but we all do that. And again, th there's Plenty of reasons for why we tend to be overconfident uh, and why we oftentimes persist in our overconfidence despite lots of evidence to the contrary. Yeah? If we were all correctly calibrated about how much we're going to get done in a given day, we would never get up in the morning. Right? So it's, it's great to have this planning fallacy to, to sort of think about how, how great things will be because then we're motivated to actually go and make it happen and these things are self-fulfilling prophecies. But the other thing that has, I think, uh, become very apparent from these uh, case studies is that it's really, really useful to have a plan B in your back pocket before you go forth in a confident way and pursue plan A. Okay. Um, now, let me sort of talk about the third reason for why we don't plan ahead of time, uh, which is that we tend to sort of regret uh, errors of uh, commission. Okay, so let's assume you have this wonderful job uh, and your wife is happy, your kid is having, uh, you know, sort of financing for college and you think, well, but I'm not particularly happy with this. You know, I could be doing better than that. I really should be going back to school or I really should just sort of take that step uh, into the net uh, and start my own company. Well, what if it doesn't work out? Yeah? First of all, you're not never going to hear the end of that from your brother-in-law uh, or from your spouse. Uh, but also yourself, you anticipate how bad you will feel when you actually sort of take that step and it doesn't work out. So we sort of really regret, in anticipate regretting uh, errors of things that we actually did. Now let me sort of tell you one other fact. When people are on their deathbed or getting close to dying and you ask them, what is it that you regret in life? They don't regret the, the, the two or three things that they did that turned out badly. They regret all the opportunities that they didn't take. Yeah? And so late in life, when we look back on our lives, we really regret those errors of omissions. Yeah? Those opportunities we, sort of, we, we thought about in passing, but then sort of walked away from because we were sort of so focused on the here and now and our current status quo. Yeah? So just keep that in mind uh, as you think about sort of regretting errors of uh, commission. Okay? So that was lesson number one. <laughs> Let me walk over here and tell you about lesson number two. So when you make these decisions about life changes, career opportunities, uh, one thing I advise you to do is to use the full range of choice processes, of decision processes, or what I would call decision modes at your disposal. Yeah? What do I mean by decision modes? Well, typically people will sort of say, well, make a list of pros and cons, yeah? or make a matrix like consumer reports. Uh, here are your different alternatives, different job offers, here are the different attributes, you know, sort of income, uh, vacation time, uh, advancement potential, blah, 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 blah. Uh, think about sort of how each of these opportunities sort of fares on these dimensions, what is the importance of different dimensions, then you can sort of do a multi-attribute utility matrix, and the one with the highest score is the one that you should be doing. 
Uh, or we do it by just pros and cons, checklists. What, what's good about this? What's good about that? So all of these modes are analysis, right? We're thinking rationally in some sort of conscious way about what's good, what's bad about these different options. And that's great, and you certainly should be doing that. And I think I want to argue in a, in a minute, it's going to inform all of these other modes that we also have at our disposal. But when push comes to shove, most of the time, we don't make decisions you know, in a fully rational way. Yeah? Sort of two other modes, and there are at least two other modes uh, at our disposal are not decisions just with our head, but also with our heart. Yeah? We have emotional reactions, we have hopes, we have fears, uh, we have gut level reactions that are based on lots of past experience that are oftentimes quite valid, that kick in when we aren't even consciously aware about what it is that we're afraid of, but you know, it, it's helping it. It's an early warning system that tells us what's good in the world and what's bad about in the world. And we certainly should be paying attention to those uh, head uh, to these heart signals, these emotional signals as well. Because that's mode number two. Okay? And then the third mode that oftentimes that also is influencing our, influencing our decisions is making decisions by the book. There are rules of conduct, there are social norms. You shouldn't be changing your job when you're in your 50s. That's way too old. You should be doing that in your 30s. Uh, you do certain things uh, because you are a woman or because you're not a woman, because you have kids or you don't have kids. Yeah? And these rules oftentimes also influence our decisions. Um, and Many times, these different modes, head, heart, and book, telling us the same option. Option A is the best one, yeah? or stick with your job, that's the thing to do. Uh, and if that's the case, you actually have high confidence in your decision, and you should be having high confidence in your decision, and you should be going ahead and doing that. Now, every once in a while, and you know, perhaps not so infrequently when you're thinking about change, the different modes tell you different stories. One of them says A, your head says A, your heart says B, and maybe the rules are sort of you know, inconclusive because you can think about a rule of conduct for each one. And let me sort of tell you uh, a story about that that goes back 20 years when I was teaching a course on decision analysis at the University of Chicago uh, in an MBA program. Uh, and the first assignment I gave people, the MBA students, was to take an important decision they were making, currently making in their life uh, and to come up with a multi-attribute utility matrix. You know, what are the different choice options? What are the different attributes? Uh, think about your importance based on these attributes and then sort of tell me which, the op which option I it is that you, you will be choosing. And the day before the assignment was due, a woman came, came to my office during office hours and she said, it's not working. I said, well, what do you mean it's not working? He said, well, I have these three options, uh, and I keep, you know, the analysis is telling me the wrong one. So I said, well, what, what are the options? Well, it turns out she was dating three guys in the previous year. <laughs> <laughs> this was the second year, just came back from, from, from the summer. She wanted to know which of the guys she should be going steady with. <laughs> and so she had these, you know, three candidates. She had the different attributes. Uh, um, physical attractiveness, sense of humor, reliability, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and she said, well, I mean, I really want B, yeah? but whatever I do, I'm not coming up with B. So I said, well, why don't we work backwards? <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's evaluate how you rated those, and that was fine. And I said, well, let's now look at your importance weights. You know, what would the importance weights have to be for you to come up with B as the best one? Well, we did that, and the only combination of weights was everything was on physical attractiveness. <laughs> 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 now, this was useful to her because now she could decide, and clearly her gut was telling her to go sort of with, with a good-looking guy, yeah? and perhaps that was okay for a second-year MBA student. You yeah, didn't have to marry this guy. But yeah, basically, <laughs> So she ended up not going with analysis, but going with her heart. But doing the analysis actually helped her to clarify what her heart was responding to. Uh, and using that, she could then evaluate, was that what she wanted to do? Yeah? Was that the rule, everything on physical attractions that she was happy with, or not? Uh, and so she had the option of deciding to go one way or the other. Yeah? And so let me just sort of finish on that, and I think we can take this into discussion. <laughs> <laughs>